Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us, 11th grade parents and scholars. We are so excited to have you. Um, right now, you are in the English presentation. Ms. Rojas is doing the Spanish presentation. So if you do prefer Spanish, you can head on over to her um, meeting and that is in your email. But here is our agenda for the day. Um, we're just, there's going to be lots of reminders um, and there's going to be some stuff that we're going to be planning for 12th grade, but it's really talking about um, your viable path, reminders about the graduation requirements versus A through G requirements, um, admissions exams, which are going to be coming up soon, the ever-present financial aid and college costs, um, and then senior year timeline and how to really um, prepare now. So first, who are your counselors? I am Cindy Strenning. Um, I'm the lead co uh, college and career counselor at E3. And my caseload is the last names M through Z. And then we have Ms. Rojas. She is doing the Spanish presentation right now. Um, and her caseload is A through L. And we both um, work with our scholars and our families on academics. We do a little social emotional. We have family meetings and it's a lot of college planning. So right now we are in um, just getting through the college applications with the seniors, um, and it's probably our favorite thing to do. So we love this part of this time of year. And then we have Mr. Smith, of course, is our director of wellness. He's our therapist um, on site that provides so much support for our scholars and our families. So if you feel like you need um, or would like to talk with Mr. Smith, he is always available, always willing to help. And uh, so this is your wellness team right here. And you see Mr. Smith with his cat because we, we both have cats. So we wanted to put his cat in there as well. Um, and then I wanted to talk a little bit about paving a viable path. Um, we are moving from college, college, college to a viable path. Um, so your students and your scholars have been um, working um, and hearing about a viable path for the last, uh, I would say six months or so. Um, so we've defined it for you and a viable path is really a personalized, flexible and attainable plan for your future in order to be prosperous, happy and independent. Um, so that is our goal is for every student at E3 to have a diploma in one hand and a map in the other upon graduation. So a map would be my action plan because um, we know there are so many careers out there um, and we want that career to be viable. So that doesn't mean that you have to go to a four year university and spend a bunch of money. We have a lot of scholars that wanna go into the trades or a certification program and that is okay. What really matters is that you have that path, that goal to get there. So that way they can move out of your houses one day maybe <laughs> and be able to be independent and have the family of their own. Um, so we're really striving towards a viable pathway rather than pushing college, college, college on everybody. Um, so what we've been explaining to your scholars about a viable path, it's really um, about a bunch of different things. So we want them to do what they love. So we've been doing the RIASEC assessment uh, to find out their interests and preferences, what they really love to do. Um, and then we've looked at um, what employers need. So what are those um, on the job credentials, certifications, uh, licensing, diplomas, training that um, the, the job force that what employers are looking for and what they need. Um, and then we're looking for what the scholars need. Like how do, how do they wanna live their life? Do they want, um, what's their job quality? What's their life quality? Um, and then understanding that life is not static. So it changes over time and your interest can change over time. And then we're gonna take all three of those things and what you can get paid for. Cause we wanna make sure that what they are getting into the labor market is demanding. So we've been kind of working with um, these four bubbles so that way, right in the middle, they can find out what their next move is. And we've been working with the San Diego Workforce Partnership on this, and they've led um, a six-week mapping my future lesson and advisory to go through you know, their interests. Where do they see themselves in 30 years? Um, hold on, somebody's coming in. Um, what skills do they have and things like that? And like what is out there? So it's not just college, it's certification programs, it's in, uh, apprenticeships, it's all kinds of things for them to get into. 
Um, and then we also talked to them about expectations versus reality. I know when I was in high school, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to go to college. I'm going to get my degree and then I'm going to get a career and I'm going to be successful. And as we all know, as adults, that's not really how it goes. There are ups and downs and there are many, many different viable paths and all paths look different. Um, there's just a ton of different ways to get to your viable path. So it could look like high school, a two-year degree, a four-year degree, and then maybe an industry certification. Or a lot of scholars are wanting to work right out of school. So maybe they go get that certification first, work for a bit, and then they go that two-year and then that four-year route. There's all different ways to get to your goal. Um, so we're trying to teach and instill in your scholars all of these different variety of ways to get to their path. Um, so that is the viable path. You'll be hearing a lot more about that um, throughout the next couple of years as your scholars move on to their 12th grade year. Uh, but I wanted to just go over a reminder about what A through G requirements are and what um, high school requirements are. Um, but the A through G, this is going to become very important next year. The A through G is a sequence of courses that must be taken in high school in order to be eligible to apply to a UC so a University of California campus or a CSU campus. Um, your scholars must earn a C or higher in all of these A through G courses in order to be eligible to apply to these universities. So that means if they receive a D or an F, um, we don't do Ds or Fs anymore, but NGs, they would have to retake that course. Um, and I've also linked our A through G course list right there. It's kind of a cool site to look through. Uh, I'll be sharing these slides out tomorrow so that way you'll have access to all of these links. And I know we have a small crowd here right now. So if you do have any questions as I'm going through this, please feel free to chat. I'll try to keep monitoring the chat um, or you can unmute and ask those questions. I will be going through a lot of information. So I apologize in advance for inundate you with all this. Um, but speaking of the A through G requirements, E3, definitely our graduation requirements, um, definitely meet and exceed the A through G requirements. So your scholars are getting the classes that they need um, in order to be A through G eligible. And if they do, I, I see the scholars in this chat, so there shouldn't be um, any problems with any of your scholars failing any classes. But if they did, definitely I would make sure that they would retake that so they would be A through G eligible. Um, but our graduation requirements is the green. Um, the difference is there's a little bit of a difference um, in the years that we, we ask that our scholars complete is we require right now a computer science course. Um, that will be a requirement, I believe, in two or three years. E3 is just ahead of the game, and we're wanting to require that computer science course. So that is a requirement that all of your scholars are completing. Um, and then we also require some other graduation requirements, such as the SAT exam. Um, right now, with the pandemic, we've waived it last year. I believe we're waiving it this year. I'm not really sure, um, but I'm not sure the, the future that the SAT holds just because of the difference that it, um, the SAT is making in college admissions right now. Um, so I will keep you up to date as much as possible on if that is a requirement, but as of now, it is still a board requirement that your scholars do take that SAT exam. And we'll talk about that in just a couple slides. We will provide the SAT school day for your junior students, uh, for your junior scholars in, I believe, April for free. So don't worry if it is a requirement, we're going to be covering that and we'll be able to host that SAT at E3. Um, some of the other requirements I put on this slide for you, um, just these are the senior year expectations. So keep this in mind as your scholars finishing up this really hard 11th grade year. I know 11th grade is really difficult. We do have a lot of senior um, requirements. So some of the requirements that they would have to complete next year is that workforce development course. So that would be their internship. Um, they also have to complete their senior design capstone course. Um, so that's, it'll, it'll be the same course, it just kind of rotates. So Mondays and Wednesdays, they would take design thinking and Tuesdays and Thursdays, they would take their workforce development course. So that would eventually be their internship. So they would leave on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Right now, the seniors can leave about 1230 to go on their internships. 
So those are the two classes that are required for seniors for like on this end. Um, they also have to complete their senior presentation of learning, which is so cool. If you don't know what that is, um, that's basically happens in June, right before we send them off to that big bad world. Um, and it's just a day where we, the seniors get to stop and reflect and present to scholars, to family members, to um, board members, to staff, and talk about their life, talk about high school and some of the obstacles they face. What were their favorite projects and presentations? Um, and what is their future plan? So it's really cool. It's very, um, it's usually very emotional. We always end up crying because they have such great stories. And of course, we'll miss them. Uh, but that is a requirement for our seniors. And then we get into um, college prep. Um, like I said, we're moving towards viable pathway, but it is still a requirement just because we want them to have that experience that they have to complete. They have to submit at least one four-year college application. Um, they have to submit their financial aid application that is going to be a state requirement next year. Um, if for some reason a family does not want to submit the financial aid application, there is a waiver form, but a financial aid application is not going to do anything um, harmful. It's only going to provide you free money. So we definitely want our families to submit their financial aid application. And then they also have to submit at least one scholarship application. Um, so those are kind of the outlier senior year requirements. And then on the right-hand side, you'll see our usual senior year required courses. All of our seniors are in a 12th grade English, so they can either choose from, it's called CSU Expository Reading and Writing Composition. So that's the basic college prep English course, or they can choose to take AP English Literature. So that's the more challenging um, course that they can choose to take. And then all of our seniors, are in US government one semester, and then the next semester they're in economics. And then, like I said, they will have to take design thinking and the workforce development course. And then all of our seniors are in my favorite course, which is the college prep course, because we get to lead that. And that is just two hours on Fridays to help them through the entire college process. Um, so right now, the we meet with the seniors, we give them updates. So like any deadlines that are coming in and then we have breakouts so they can get that one-on-one -on -one help with their college applications, the scholarships, the financial aid. So that's a really cool course for our seniors to take advantage of because in most schools they're scrambling to get that stuff done. Here at E3, we give that time during the school day as well as in the afternoons, we lead a lot of college workshops. So that's a really cool course for them to look forward to. Does anybody have any questions on the senior year requirements or what's to um, come up ahead? We'll be meeting again in May, so we'll go through it a little bit more. But if you have any questions, just let me know. Okay. Questions? Yeah, no questions? No questions. Okay, awesome. Um, so then we have a transcript. I'm sure you all know about a transcript, but I just like to remind everybody that this is a detailed record of your scholars grades each school year. So on the left hand side, you kind of see what it looks like. Um, and they're all of their grades, their final grades combine into a GPA. So colleges request this, scholarships could request this, jobs could request this. Uh, so it's really important that our scholars are trying to get the best final grades that they can. Um, and also just a side note for the UC applications and the CSU applications, they have to um, manually report all of these courses and grades. So the application is um, pretty intrinsic and it's pretty, um, pretty tough to do. So that's why we always like to complete that application with them. So that way there's no mistakes because um, it is pretty hard to, to understand right away. So what I try to tell my juniors and my seniors how to be successful, especially as you're getting older, and I'm sure as parents you know, is to meet deadlines. Um, these college application deadlines are no joke. They will not extend, although CSU just extended for 15 days due to some technical issues. Um, and we try to get them not to procrastinate. That was a problem this year. We give them so much time during the school day and that we have um, college workshops every afternoon. And I had about 20, 25 seniors in my office on the deadline day trying to get the application done. And there was 
technical issues with the website, which we already had warned them. So if I had it my way, we would have the applications in before Thanksgiving, and then we wouldn't have to stress over that. So please have them not procrastinate. And I'm sure you're telling them that on your end as well. Um, and then just taking advantage of their time. At E3, we offer so much time and so many resources to take advantage of that. Um, I know it's hard sometimes when we want to break, but really trying to take advantage of that time is crucial, especially senior year. I know Ms. Dorsey already had a senior go through. She already has a college student, so she knows that stress that comes along with that time of year. So taking advantage and not procrastinating are like two of my top uh, tips. And then trying to do as much college prep as possible before the senior year. We will meet with your juniors. We're, we have a um, a meeting scheduled soon and then obviously in the spring to really prepare them um, but as long as they're doing their college research they kind of know what they're interested in um, they start a college list they can even start on their essays and personal insight questions um, they can ask for recommendation letters in the spring so as much as they can do in that downtime the spring and the summer because once fall hits senior year, it is go, 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 and it is stressful. Um, so we're definitely going to talk to them about trying to prepare as much as they can, and we'll provide some resources for them as well. So this is just a quick look into the California college system. I am going to repeat this probably in May, and then again in October during our first senior meeting, because College is so complicated and California college system is so complicated that it usually takes a few times to understand. Um, but before we get into that, just to review the types of colleges out there, there are the public universities. Those are like the UCs, the CSUs, the, the four-year bachelor's degrees. They're usually the cheapest option. We have private universities. So that's like um, University of San Diego, those are more um, independent, they're generally smaller, and they're generally more expensive. However, that doesn't mean you can't afford it, or it might be a cheaper option, because they get to offer a lot more scholarships to cover the costs. And then we have our community colleges, which are amazing here in San Diego. You can get a two-year associate's. Um, you can go there for the trades. You can go there for a certification. So that's where a lot of our scholars will go if they're interested in auto body or um, HVAC or plumbing or welding. Um, and then also they go there to transfer to a four year because it's the most affordable option with the promise grant. It is free for two years. So it is really, really a, a financially smart decision to attend a community college in California just financially wise. Um, and then we also talk, I, I know I talked to you about, um, let me see. Oh, I just got a chat from Ms. Dorsey. Mesa and Grossman are offering four-year degrees in some of their programs. Yes, that is a brand new thing, and I can't wait to hear more about that. I'm going to try to attend a couple of their professional developments to learn more. But yeah, community colleges are starting to offer that, which is great because some of these state schools, and especially the private schools, are way, way, way too expensive. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, but I know I talked about we're really focusing on a viable path, but I wanted to keep this slide in here because it really shows um, why go to college, but just why get some kind of certification, because as we know, not many jobs are open to just a high school graduate anymore. You usually need some type of training or certification after high school, and this is just a graph. This is from 2014. On, level of education and how much more you can make with your level of education. So obviously we know um, going to college or going to get a certification program, uh, a certification or a trade or an apprenticeship is well worth that time and effort. So that way you can make a little bit more money, especially living in San Diego. And then what colleges are looking for. Um, every single college is different. Every single college looks for different things. And I'll talk a little bit more about the California system just in a second, but they're usually, they're all looking at GPA. So um, right now your scholar's job is to get the best grades that they can, because that's gonna be the number one indicator um, is their GPA. I kept test scores on here. Right now, a lot of colleges went test blind 
because of the pandemic, because um, a lot of our students could not take the SAT or ACT. This, this year, like for next school year coming up, like for uh, the freshmen, the seniors now graduating, their freshman year of college, they did not need to usually provide that SAT or ACT. We do not know how it's going to be for your students just yet. Um, this, some colleges have said yes, or some colleges have said no, some colleges have said maybe. Um, so we'll kind of see, but we definitely want to keep that an option and keep that as uh, a requirement that some colleges might be looking for. They're also looking for a challenging course load. Did your scholars take advantage of AP courses, honors courses, college courses? They want to see, even if they didn't do as well as they wanted to in those courses, they want to see that they challenge themselves. If your scholar is not enrolled in a college course next semester, I do have some space in the political science and potentially the sociology. So reach out to me if you um, want to hear more about those options. Some colleges look for recommendation letters, not many. Um, so just keep that in mind. So when you're looking at colleges and looking at their requirements, um, look at what they require in their application. Some require recommendations, some don't. The UC system does not. The CSU system does not. They only require recommend recommendations for the EOP program. Uh, but it just really depends on the college. Some colleges are looking at essays. Um, again, the, the UC system, they have four personal insight questions that they require the students to complete. The CSU systems are not, they're really just looking at GPA. And then colleges are looking at um, extracurricular activities and not just you know, joining something senior year, they're looking at sustained extracurricular activities. What did they get involved in ninth grade and they continued? What did they get leadership positions in? So that's what they really wanna see, that they were involved um, in a sustained activity. And it's also okay for them to join a club and really not like that and then join another club because that's also trying to explore their interests. So as long as they're getting involved, they're doing something outside of their school day, um, that's what they really wanna see. Like it, uh, volunteer service, internships, anything that they're doing outside of the school day, I always tell the students to brag about themselves. And another tip, have your scholars sit down and write a list of everything they've done, they've done in high school, because by the time they become a senior, they have to really think hard about what, what they've done. So now I'll talk a little bit about the colleges. I'm going to focus just on the California system because many of our students, this is where they focus. But I also try to get our seniors to think outside of the box um, because California tends to be very, very, very competitive um, and very difficult. If they go to a different school, like um, they look at different state schools, it's not as competitive to get in. I'm from Chicago and I was like, it was amazing to see the requirements and the, the competitiveness that California had. Because my students in Chicago, even if they had a 2.75 GPA, they, pro they had a good shot of getting into a state school. Um, so it's kind of heartbreaking in California to see even if the student works hard, it's not always guaranteed that they get into the campus of their dreams. Um, that being said, there is the University of California system. So those are nine campuses across California. Their requirements are very um, holistic. They're looking at everything. They wanna see that GPA, that usually a 3.0 GPA or higher. Um, like I explained before, they have four personal insight questions that they require. So they give, a, they give eight questions eight prompts and the scholars have to choose four to respond to. They're just 350 words max, so they're not very long essays, um, but they use this as more of an interview. They want to know about the scholar. It has to be about them, so um, that's my advice to the scholars when they're writing these. Is tell the reader about yourself. Um, you know, really answer the questions from your heart because it's like kind of an interview on paper. They're not looking at SAT scores this year. That might change for next year. Um, they are looking at extracurricular activities and volunteering, um, leadership positions, all of that. They're looking at everything. Um, and then you can apply to all of these campuses on one application. And I've linked that here in case you want to like look around. 
um, if you it, it is seventy dollars per application. If you um, if you qualify, sorry, I'm losing my words because it's been such a long day. If you qualify for a fee waiver, you can apply to up to four campuses for free. So that's the UC system, very holistic review. Um, and then we go to the California State University system where there's 23 campuses across California and they are not holistic at all. They're really a numbers game. They're looking at GPA. They used to look at SAT scores. They don't anymore. I don't know about next year. Um, they, from that, they create an eligibility in, index. So they basically say, if I'm applying as a business major, they're going to review you with all the business majors and they're going to take the top 25% for GPA. There's really, they have a few different eligibility things. So they might choose somebody in San Diego County rather than outside of the county. So you, we get a couple extra points for living in San Diego and different things like that, but it's really a numbers game. The application is simple. There's no essays. It could take maybe half an hour. Um, and the, again, it's one application to apply to all 23 universities. It's $70 per application. At least that's this year. They upped it last year. So I don't think they'll up it again this year. Um, and then if you qualify for a fee waiver, you get up to four campuses for free. And then we have our amuse, amazing, amazing community college district. Um, they, there's eight community colleges in San Diego alone. There's 110 community colleges in California. You can earn credits to transfer to a four-year university. There's certification programs, there's trade programs. And like Ms. Dorsey said, they're beginning to offer a few bachelor's degrees as well. Uh, a lot of our scholars go to San Diego City, Mesa, Southwestern. Uh, we have college courses on campus from City, so it's a great school to go to. And again, it's free for two years with the Promise Grant. So that's just a brief overview of colleges. I would really do some research, get your college list going, and we'll talk more about that in the spring. Um, but for now, I want to talk about the infer, uh, admissions tests. There are two. There's an SAT versus ACT. At E3, we really focus on the SAT. There's four sections, reading, math, writing, and language. The only difference in the ACT and the SAT is that the ACT has science. Uh, the scoring, the highest you can get is a 1600 and the ACT is 36. There's no penalties for wrong answers. So we always, always, always say guess if you're running out of time or if you don't know. And then um, in order to register for an SAT or an ACT administration date, they would have to register on their own. So they on SAT, they would register on College Board. And then on um, ACT, they would register on ACT students. And the test is about $60, $65 each time they want to sit for a Saturday administration. If you qualify for a fee waiver, you can contact us and we can help you with a fee waiver. And you're allowed two fee waivers for each test. However, like I mentioned, for the SAT, we're slated to have the SAT school day in April at E3. That's completely free. That will be during the school day. It's, it's usually a really special day for the kiddos. We get them breakfast. If it's uh, because they can take it on campus with their, uh, with their own peers, they tend to be a little bit less stressed. If they register for any of these other test dates, that would be on a Saturday. E3 does host it, but we only have seats for 100. So they would have to choose from any sites that are in um, California and they would be sitting in a, you know, they could be sitting in a strange place with strange people taking the test. That's how I took the test. So we're really, really happy um, that we could provide that SAT school day. And I'll have that date for you soon. It's looking like it would be the end of April. So for our kiddos, how they prepare for the SAT, we'll obviously have some SAT prep within our school day, usually during an advisory, um, but they can also start now on Khan Academy. You can connect Khan Academy with your PSAT score that you did. I think, believe ninth grade was the last year we were able to provide a PSAT. Um, and, or you can take a practice exam and Khan Academy will give individualized SAT prep. They can also take a full length SAT practice test, which I really, really um, think is a great way to, 
to time themselves because that SAT is such a long test that they have to build up that testing stamina, 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 sorry. Um, also paying attention in class, especially English and math. Uh, and read into the SAT test taking strategies. It's not all about what you know, it's about reading the, the question and answering it correctly, because there are some a lot, a lot of strategies that come along with that. And we usually have CalSOAP come in and do about a four week test taking strategy lesson with them. So that will provide that before they have that SAT exam. And then I linked what to expect on the test day. So there's, there's just some links. So if you want your scholars to get started in preparing for that SAT, feel free to use these resources. Okay, now I'm gonna get into the scary stuff college costs. I know Ms. Dorsey knows this because we've already gone over this and she probably already has sticker shock. Um, but college is expensive. <laughs> Look at her. <laughs> she has a little crying symbol. Um, UCSD alone is $15,000 just for tuition per year. On-campus housing is just over $16,000. And then you're all adding in some personal expenses, you know, transportation, books, supplies that can equal upwards of $34,000 per year just for UCSD. To live off campus is 26,000 ish. Uh, so that's the cheaper route, but I really recommend if your scholars can live on campus to do so. Just it, it's proven that they just jump into college life a little bit better, do a little bit better in classes because they have that um, camaraderie the peers around them, especially at UCSD, they do a great job of building community. However, with UCSD, remember we have the Chancellor's Associate Scholarship Program, that CASP program. So if your students do get into UCSD and meet the financial qualifications, they will qualify automatically for that CASP scholarship, which will equal a full ride every single year. So you wouldn't be paying any money for your scholar to go to UCSD and live on campus, but you have to make sure that they're, one, they're accepted and two, that you meet the financial aid threshold. Uh, and then SDSU is the cheaper option. It is the cheapest state school. It's just over 8,000 per tuition. However, a lot of our students that go to SDSU end up living at home because their on-campus living is so, so outrageous. It's uh, upwards of $19,000 a year to live on campus. Um, so with books and supplies and personal expenses, that equals just over $30,000 a year. Um, but without housing, it can be affordable, especially if you get that Cal Grant. The Cal Grant will usually cover tuition, but you'd have to live at home or um, find out find a different living arrangement. Then we have USD, our private school example that we have here. Their tuition is over $50,000 a year. Um, on campus food and housing is uh, just about 15,000 a year. So you're looking at, oh, my math is wrong here, but you're looking at about 67,000 to live on campus and about 52,000 to not live on campus. However, but like I said, these private universities tend to offer more scholarships. So don't let the price tag defer you right now. Always, always, always apply broadly wait to get those acceptance letters and those award letters and then you you and your family can sit down and make a financial decision um, because it's really about what is cheaper we had a student a few years ago she did get into ucsd that was before the casp and then she got into george washington which is a private university that's way more expensive but she was actually offered way more scholarships to attend george washington and move across the country so she chose that um, because she barely had to pay anything out of pocket. So it's always worth applying if that's your option. And then we have our uh, community, our local community college, San Diego City. They say it's about 22,000 or 20, 2,200 a year. However, with the promise, tuition is completely free. So they're only paying for personal expenses and books. And sometimes you can even get scholarships to cover that. So that's kind of the sticker shock of what you're looking at. Um, financial aid wise, and how do you pay for it? I know hopefully there's some personal savings. Scholarships is a big one. We always, always, always try to get our scholars to apply to scholarships. However, they usually don't because they, they run out of steam. 
um, to complete those scholarships, but it's really, really important to try to apply to those scholarships. And then there's grants and loans. So basically once you apply to school and then you get accepted, that school will give you a financial aid package. So it kind of looks like this little house. There's going to be federal loans and grants and work studies. So that's what the U.S. government is offering. Then there's going to be California, so state grants, which will cover. Um, and then there's also scholarships. There's um, institutional aid. Some colleges offer a lot more institutional aid and scholarships than others. Um, and like, yeah, Ms. Dorsey just said, every dollar counts, it does. Um, if your scholar will apply for a $500 scholarship and gets it, that's books for a semester. And if that essay only took a, an hour to write, they made $500 in an hour. So it's really, really worth going to um, get scholarships, calling the school to see if there's anything else that um, you can do. So I'm just going to play a quick overview on financial aid. We'll go through this again a lot more in depth once, you're, once they're seniors, but I definitely want you to get an overview on this. If you're interested in financial aid for college or career school, you're going to need to fill out the free application for federal student aid or FAFSA. It takes most people about 30 minutes to complete online and the best part, it's 100% free and it provides you with access to grants, loans and work study funds from the federal government and many colleges and states use FAFSA information to provide their own college or state financial aid. Before you fill out the FAFSA, it's a good idea to create your FSA ID, a username and password that lets you electronically sign your FAFSA and gives you access to various websites related to federal student aid. And here's an important tip. If your parent is providing information on your FAFSA, he or she will need his or her own FSA ID. Visit studentaid.gov forward slash FSA ID for more information. Your FAFSA can be completed online at FAFSA.gov and help is provided throughout the online application process. You will need to fill out the FAFSA each year you are in school because your financial situation may change. Plus, you may be able to automatically transfer your tax data from the IRS, making the application even quicker to fill out. Each state and college or career school sets its own deadline for the FAFSA, so it's best to get it done early. Since some of the funds are available on a first-come, first-served basis, you don't want to miss out. Now that you know about the FAFSA, you might be asking, well, how much money will I get? Your college or career school will do the math, and there's a simple formula that they use. First, the college takes your cost of attendance, which is the total amount it will cost you to go to that school. Your cost of attendance will vary from school to school. Then, the college subtracts your expected family contribution, or EFC. Your EFC is based on information provided in your FAFSA and will not change based on the school you attend. However, the EFC is not necessarily the amount of money you will have to pay. Basically, your cost of attendance minus your EFC equals your financial need. Your college uses your financial need and other information to determine how much financial aid you can receive. See? Pretty simple. If you have questions or need more information, please visit studentaid.gov. Okay, so that is just a quick overview. It sounds a lot more complicated than it is. If, as long as you have all your materials, you can usually get your FAFSA done within 30 minutes and Ms. Dorsey gets to do two next year. Um, so that's really exciting. Usually when you do two, it's quicker. Um, so we talked a little bit about the federal, they usually have Pell Grant, so that's money that you don't have to pay back, and then they offer loans. We want to stay away from loans, um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the Cal Grants, that California state grants that they offer, and they offer three main ones, and then there's a bunch of little ones. Um, so there's Cal Grant A, there's Cal Grant B, and there's Cal Grant C. Uh, this is an automatic thing, so once they apply for the FAFSA, um, and we also have to upload their GPAs. So every year right before they start applying, we have to upload a report with all of our scholars and their GPAs to um, the C California State Aid Commission, uh, CSAC. So we upload that, all that information, and then they're automatically qualified for the highest grants. Um, so there's nothing that you need to do on your end besides complete that FAFSA. And then um, once that FAFSA is completed, 
About two weeks later, the scholar can create their Cal Grants for Students account and they'll see which grant they're qualified for. So if they have a, a 3.0 GPA or higher, uh, they could be qualified for Cal Grant A. That's the highest um, award that they can be offered. They can be offered up to $12,570 per year, depending on the college. So that's for like a UC. For a CSU, it will cover their tuition. So um, it just depends on what college they go to. If they go out of state, unfortunately, they cannot take the Cal Grants with them. This is just an in-state um, grant that they can get. So that's the one you want to get. If you don't have a 3.0 or higher, you may be eligible for the Cal Grant B. So that's up to 1,648 per year. And then Cal Grant C, again, a 2.0, but that's usually used for vocational programs. So there's nothing that you really need to do. It's, it's just like an automatic thing after you complete that FAFSA. But the one thing I want to know, like, Grades are very important because GPA is very important and many scholarships have GPA uh, requirements. Not so many have SAT requirements this year just because of the pandemic. Uh, so it's really, really important that your scholars keep their GPA up. And speaking about Cal grants, there is an opt-out requirement. I am required by the California Ed Code to allow students in the eighth grade an uh, option to opt out of being automatically considered as a Cal Grant applicant. So that means if you do not want us to send your scholars GPAs to CSAC to be eligible for these, this free money, you can just simply uh, complete this Cal Grant opt-out form and we will, not be, we will not submit your scholars GPA. However, we're submitting it for you to get free money. So just keep that in mind. So I am legally uh, like required to tell you this and to offer you this Cal Grant opt-out form. And it is linked on the slides, which I'll be uh, sending out tomorrow, as well as it's linked on our website. So I talked a lot about all that stuff. What to expect senior year. Um, this is kind of a timeline. So in the spring, we're going to start kicking off their junior year coming up soon, but in the spring, we'll be meeting with your scholars a little bit more, taking the SAT, and really this time is about keeping their grades as high as they can go, because this is really making that last impact onto their GPA, because they're going to be applying for colleges in the fall of next year. So all the only grades that their colleges are gonna see are their ninth, 10th and 11th grade grades. They're gonna see the courses that they're gonna be taking senior year, but they will not see those grades. So they really wanna make this final impact on their GPA. Um, and the biggest thing is just start looking at colleges, having those conversations researching all of the different colleges out there. There's thousands um, and then really start a college list start thinking about where you want to apply and then we'll refine that as we go but that's really the things that you want to do and then if you can visit campuses from the pandemic all of the campuses were really really good about providing virtual tours so you can go on any website and go on a virtual tour of their campus um, and get all kinds of information and you don't even have to go there so that's really one what, what i want our juniors to to focus on now or like in the spring in the summer and then in the fall, it's go time. You'll be seeing us a lot more often. We have about four parent meetings that we hold like this, just to kind of give you all that information that we're giving your students. It's a lot, it's overwhelming. We understand that. That's why we kind of start freshman year and move, move on and talk a little bit more intricately about these things. Um, but it's really time to submit those applications and the financial aid. Financial aid applications open up October 1st. So put that on your calendars. That's really go time is October 1st for all these colleges. And the UC and the CSU deadline is usually November 30th. It has changed a bit in the last couple of years, but keep November 30th in your uh, mind. We usually have an E3 deadline of the Friday before we leave for fall break. That's our, that's our in-house deadline because we want them to not procrastinate, to get those applications in so that way they can enjoy their time over Thanksgiving with their family. And then financial aid, that, deadline, that financial aid, like I said, is opened up on October 1st. That deadline for California is March 2nd. We are not one of those states that is first come, first serve. As long as you get your financial aid in by March 2nd, you will be eligible for a Cal Grant. 
However, it's usually better to get that in sooner than later just for colleges. So they might be reviewing those early for scholarships. So you want to try to get your, your financial aid as, as soon as possible. And then the springtime is really receiving acceptance letters. We've actually received like 20 acceptance letters so far. It's so early this year. So I'm super excited to celebrate our seniors, but they're gonna be getting those acceptance letters after their acceptance letters, they'll be receiving their award letters. So that's really telling you, breaking down how much you're gonna to have to pay out of pocket, what grants your scholars receive, what scholarships, what loans are being offered. So that breaks it down and don't worry, we will have a meeting to discuss award letters. They can get really confusing. Then after you're looking at all your award letters, you're going to make a decision. You have to, for four-year universities, that decision day is May 1st. That's another day you want to keep in your um, head. Usually for four-year universities, that deadline is May 1st. Some are June 1st, some are August 1st. For two years, they can uh, register throughout even the summer. So two years just has a, a later date, but for four years, especially UCs and CSUs, May 1st, they have to make that decision. And then there's just a lot of enrollment paperwork that they have to complete, a lot of to-dos that they have to complete as well. So tips to start preparing now is SAT or ACT prep. We're still moving in that direction, even though we don't know what's gonna happen in the future. So we're hoping to have that SAT prep in school and take that SAT in school. And like I said before, maintaining their GPA is one of the top priorities they should have. 11th grade counts for college admissions is probably the, the, the top year that they're looking at. Um, so you really wanna keep your grades as high as they can and take those challenging courses, boost that GPA up. Research and visit colleges, look outside of the box. I know I'm talking a lot about California schools, but there are so many colleges out there and colleges that offer a lot of money because they want your scholars at their school. Um, so start looking outside of the box, looking at those smaller schools. And then really, if they're not participating in extracurricular activities to start participating, if they are participating is to continue to participate and really take on some leadership opportunities. Um, that's huge, especially for the UCs. They wanna see that they've taken on leadership opportunities. And then really thinking about future career goals, possible college choices, starting their college list. Um, there are so many options out there and it's always a great conversation to have with your scholars. I remember talking to my mom because when I went to high school, I just knew, okay, well, I'm going to go to college. And I just picked the college I wanted to go to. And I asked my mom as an adult, well, how did I just know that? And she's like, well, because we talked about it all the time. So my mom always said that if you go to college, when you go to college, what do you want to do? So having those family conversations are also really key. They might not want to talk back to you. I know I was a teenager and I probably didn't want to answer my mom, but it, like they hear you. They hear what you're talking about. And then another scary one, um, senior year comes along with a lot of expenses. Again, Ms. Dorsey's down there probably saying, yes, it does. Um, so I just wanted to give you a warning about this. College application fees can get expensive. The CSUs and UCs are $70 per campus. Um, they can range from 50. I've seen them to be 100, 150 if you're not qualified for a fee waiver. If you want to take additional SAT or ACT exams, those can be upwards of $60 per um, sit. So if they want to take that three times, that could be $60 each time. And then even sending your scores. So these colleges ask for you them to send, they ask you to send their official scores to each school. That's $13 per school. And then we have Justin's comes in. Justin's does all of our graduation and class of 2023. Um, gear. So that's where you'd buy your cap and gown. That's where if you want to get a class ring or a cool t-shirt or uh, graduation announcements, those packages could be from $30 to upwards of $300, depending on what kind of package you'd like. If your scholar is interested in grad night, that could be $200. Yearbook, $30. Prom could be $70. And then that's not even including actually enrolling in college. So once if for a four year university, once you wanna say, yes, I wanna go here, they're gonna ask you for a college enrollment fee. That's a non-refundable college enrollment fee, about 100, I've seen them at 500 just to enroll to save your seat. 
And then if they're living in housing, there could also be a deposit to save your seat in the housing of 100 to 500. So I just, these are all estimates. I just wanted to give you a heads up. I don't want you to get shocked next year when, you're, when your student's coming home and saying, I need this, I need that. Um, so do you have any questions on any of these costs before we move on? We're almost done. Okay, well, I'll move on because I just want, this is one of my last slides. <laughs> Ms. Dorsey, I will always be shocked. I know, me too. I cannot believe it. And that's why I added this slide in because when I get sticker shocked and I'm not even paying that, I'm just telling you this. Um, so I just want to make sure everybody is prepared. But this last slide is just a bunch of resources um, that I've collected. This studentaid.gov, if you're really interested in finding out more information about financial aid, they have a huge and great YouTube channel. Um, so they have a ton of videos and the whole financial aid process. So if you're interested, please feel free to browse these websites and we'll also give these all to your scholars. And then save the date. Our next 11th grade parent institute will be on Thursday, May 5th at 5 p.m. Oh, we can have a Cinco de Mayo together. I didn't even know that was Cinco de Mayo. So bring your tacos and we'll talk a lot more about welcome to your senior year. I'm hoping to have a couple of the senior teachers to discuss what the expectations are. So that way you are prepared for senior year. So that is it for me. Do you have any questions? I'll stop, I'll stop recording now and then we can just chat if you have any questions.